So, um, thank you, Stephen, first of all. And thank you to everybody here for coming. It's a really awful night. Um, you would think climate change wasn't taking place tonight um, because this is typical November weather. Um, but I wanted to thank Stephen in particular for taking the time um, to speak and to come tonight. Um, and also to all of you, to, as winter settles in, to indulge me for an hour. Um, it's a very rare pleasure to have people sitting who have to listen to you, who have no choice, except for students, of course. I apologize because some of them are here as well. Um, so they'll hear me twice this week. Um, but what, what, what's, what's even more rare is that you, you're not allowed to question me. Um, I can speak for 50 minutes, and, uh, and then that's it. We have a glass of wine. So I, I can more or less suggest whatever it is I want, uh, no matter how bizarre, no matter how radical. And I could even say things that some of you will really will not like, but you won't be able to do anything about it. Um, so it, 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 it's a rare pleasure. It's, I think it will only happen once in my life that that's possible. Um, it's a real honour to be appointed as a professor at the University of Brighton. I've worked here since 2001. I suspect there are one or two people in the audience who've worked here longer than that, but not many. Um, and I've become who I am in a set of relationships with other colleagues. When you celebrate something like a professorship, the first thing to recognise is that it's impossible without the relations that extend from the department you're in to the colleagues in professional services, in research and knowledge exchange, in, in particular in my case. Um, in, with students, uh, I've learned more from students than I ever have from reading books. Um, and there is one particular thing which I won't mention here that, that changed the way I thought because of a second year seminar with some students. Um, and those are the most important relationships in the academic world. But there are also other relationships. Um, my relationship with Justine, who has seen me through these last 20 years. We've supported each other through the worst and the best of the two decades of our lives together. So I, I wouldn't be here were it not for those relationships. Um, and I, I, whilst it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to be entirely narcissistic for an hour, it's also important, I think, to recognize that none of us can do this work unless there is that broader context that extends not just to our departments, but far beyond the departments at the greater university, um, which we do and should celebrate. I, in 1991, I joined the then Historical and Critical Studies Program. It became the Humanities Program, the notorious Humanities Program. I was based in Pavilion Parade for a number of years. In the periods, in the two decades since I've been here, there have been three narratives that have structured that time. The first was I joined just before 9-11, uh, which resulted in the decade of the war on terror. At the end of that decade, we saw the financial crisis, which has led to another decade of austerity, an austerity which still affects us in the university. And then, of course, COVID, a crisis around health that's affected the ways all of us live and will continue to do so. The quarter of a million people almost in the UK um, kill, uh, died through COVID, seven million people across the globe um, because of this illness. So those three narratives have, have structured my time and your time and other colleagues' time at the university. They're the kind of global narratives, but underneath that, there've been another two things, two fundamental changes that have taken place. The first is the long, slow motion crisis that's engulfing the earth. Um, I have to be honest, I was completely ignorant of this when I joined the university in 2001. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that year said this, the burning of fossil fuels will be the dominant influence on climate in the next century. The present CO2 concentration has not been exceeded in the past 420,000 years and probably not for 20 million years it's now going up at a rate of 4% a decade. Between 2001 and 2021, emissions in fact grew by almost 50%. They did not reduce. Since 1970, the number of undomesticated wild animals have been reduced. That's not the 
the number of species, but the number of actual animals, has been reduced by 60%. Alongside this crisis, though, something more positive, I think, has happened in terms of democratic politics. A gradual remaking that we haven't actually begun to properly register that has remade our understanding of democracy. Think only back to the years of John Major, and then think what's taken place in the last two decades, even within the Conservative Party, the politics of trans rights, the women's movements around the globe, the responses to femicide, climate activism, Black Lives Matter, in our university, decolonization of the curriculum. Even if you are a member of the Conservative Party, those changes have completely restructured what it is possible to do. So one of my key arguments tonight will be that both democracy has changed, and I'll try and show how, but so has our understanding of the earth and our position as creatures on the earth. That's the main topic of today's lecture, but I'm going to ask you to indulge me, because before I do that, I want, and apparently I have to go back to do this, I want to go back to these two terrible photographs. And this is the narcissistic bit, which hopefully will only last approximately 10 minutes. The photos aren't great because they are extremely old. Um, I'm not saying anything about my own age. Um, two conflicts shadowed my very early life. My parents immigrated from Ireland to escape the conflict of the early 1970s, first to Manchester and then to South Africa. These two photographs might seem completely innocent, but they're not. The first, they both are of me, but the first one here is outside a place called Groote Skier in Dutch. The Dutch phrase means big shed. It was built in 1657 by the Dutch East India Company on land from which the San people had been removed, removals that culminated in the genocide of the San peoples of Southern Africa. It was later the residence of somebody with whom you've all become familiar in recent years, Cecil John Rhodes, before he colonized Zimbabwe. The second slide, is of me sitting in a garden. And again, this might just look neutral, but this is in the context of apartheid South Africa, where I can only sit in that garden because I am of so-called European origin. Um, the apartheid government always struggled with words. They didn't know whether to say Europeans, whites, non-whites. So th there was always the struggle over terminology. But, but what looks like Family photographs are fa in fact photographs that have to be read in that context as overdetermined by a political context that I would later come to learn about. I learned about that context not from my parents. Um, I, I do have one other photograph actually. This is from Ireland in 1920 and my, my great 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 grandparents who are standing outside the front of the butcher shop would not be very happy with the arguments I'm going to be making today about the eating of animals. Um, but my parents, my great-great-grandparents had to flee Northern Ireland because the shop was burnt down in what were called the Swansea Riots in 1970. Um, but anyway, I learned about politics in South Africa in a, from two books. One of them is Nadine Gordimer's Burger's Daughter. It opened me to a world I had not known, having lived a relatively privileged white childhood in Johannesburg. The lives of white people who actively opposed apartheid. This is a book which is the story of a family of anti-apartheid activists whose lives, in effect, are destroyed because the father is, is put in jail. It's actually based on, um, on the life of, of somebody to whom this did happen and who died um, in jail. I read it as a 15-year-old. It had been banned in 1979, so I suspect some of my reading was the frisson of reading something that um, I was not supposed to read. If novels can change lives, and I'll say something about that right at the end, this novel certainly did, because it made me see things <coughs> excuse me, that I had not seen. And it made me as a teenager, normally teenage rebellion is about going to discos and rejecting parental authority, 
uh, my teenage rebellion was very different to the normal forms of teenage rebellion. But later, in 1989, and this is the copy that I bought in 1989, I read this book by Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. They were two Jewish academics who had fled the Nazi Holocaust. Many of their relatives died. And they'd moved to New York. And in 1944, they sat in the kitchen and they dictated this book to each other. It was my introduction to critical theory. The opening lines set the tone. And this is not, I, the, the lecture is positive, but the opening lines to this book are not. Enlightenment, they wrote, and remember, enlightenment is what we're supposed to do at universities. Enlightenment, they wrote, has always aimed at liberating men from fear and establishing their sovereignty. Yet the fully enlightened earth radiates disaster triumphant. Now, the immediate context was the industrialized killing of seven million Jews. The book resonated in apartheid South Africa where racist laws and, pol and policies condemned tens of millions of people to living in abject poverty, with a party in government that had, in the 1940s, supported the Nazis. Um, and many of the, the ideas that structured that government came directly from the Nazis. These authors went further, focusing on the negative consequences of what philosophy calls the Enlightenment. I'm not going to be very nice about philosophers today, so I hope that there's not too many in the audience who can question my, my destruction um, of what they say. That what they term the Enlightenment destroys lives and worlds in the name of civilization. And of course, as they point out, this was justified by supposedly the great philosophers of Europe, John Locke, Hegel, to some degree even Marx, all of whom argued that the march of progress was necessary and that those peoples who were underdeveloped should be taken along with the march of progress. There is, of course, much good that humanity has done, but alongside it, as we know with what's happening today, the, the horrific war that we're all witnessing, but alongside it we see war, poverty, the extinction of species, the destruction of ecosystems that sustain both our life and the lives of others. In 1947, these philosophers anticipated what I am speaking about today. The whole earth, they write, bears witness to the glory of man. But unreasoning creatures, some of them human beings, have encountered rationality throughout the ages in war and in peace, in the hunt and in the slaughterhouse. That is what rationality means for them. Those two books, one a novel, one critical theory, were key to a very difficult decision that I took in 1988. I was one of 143 young white men who refused to serve in the South African army because it defended the apartheid system. I'm actually in this picture, but um, my face... My, the photo, it's the only photo that remains, and of course I'm looking somewhere else. Um, so all you can see is my nose and profile. Um, every man classified as white at the age of 18 had to spend two years in the army protecting this racist system. As white people who opposed apartheid, a tiny minority, there were about 200,000 recruits to the army. So 143 gives you a sense of how small this was. We had to determine how best we objected. We didn't suffer the, the oppression experienced by the majority of the population, and there was strict regulation of any interaction between black and white people. The best way we could oppose apartheid was to undermine the army that preserved apartheid. It was, you might say, a first lesson in decolonization, learning the position you're in and learning what you can do in that position rather than simply being guilty about what you do, actually trying to act from the position that you occupy. I left South Africa in 1995 to study with Ernesto Leclau at the University of Essex. I completed my PhD in 1998 after the most intense period of reading and learning I've ever experienced. Leclau was in exile 
from Argentina. He'd been driven out by the military dictatorship in the early 1970s. And he had a huge group of, resource, of, of research students at the University of Essex. As a consequence, we worked together. We used to meet every Wednesday morning as a group of students. We argued with each other. We presented our work. We learned from each other. Um, and that model of doing PhD work has far more in common with the sciences than the humanities. Humanities, ironically, tends to individualize doctoral research. The sciences does the reverse, it, although many humanities colleagues never, never recognize this. Um, in my view, this is a far better model of doing PhD work, working with groups of colleagues with common interests, where you can share ideas, where you get tested by others. And we've tried to do that in CAPI, obviously under constrained circumstances, the Center for Applied Philosophy, Politics, and Ethics that Stephen mentioned. I learned one really important thing from Ernesto Leclau that I could not learn in South Africa. In democratic politics, one has to work with those with whom you disagree. You cannot presume that you are right. You cannot presume that people will consent to what you think. Absolutist positions in politics lead either to terror or to abject failure. Politics is contingent and it requires skillful, difficult, often contested negotiations. Um, I don't think that all of my colleagues agree with me about that. But I think that that, that basic respect is the starting point for any idea of democratic politics, both in the university and outside the university. Now, I've, I've gone on speaking about the past, which I'm going to move on from now. And you might be saying, well, he's a professor of critical theory. What the hell is that? Um, because it's, it's kind of rare. Um, there's not that many people who call themselves critical theorists in the world today. So I want to try and give you a sense now, first of all, of what I mean by critical theory um, and why I think it's important. And, and this description, again, wouldn't be agreed because people who study philosophy and politics contest every bloody thing possible, um, as you will know. Um, put two in a room together and you'll have ten disagreements, not one. Um, but for me, these are the basic things. This is how I work. And the first is that I'm studying social and political systems in the way engineers might study um, the systems, the me mechanical systems that hold something together or electrical systems. And, but to do that, you have to work in an interdisciplinary manner. Um, you cannot stay restricted to the one or the single discipline from which you work. So for me, that's absolutely central. And secondly, related to that first point, I'm interested in the, what, what, what Judith Butler once called the tears in the fabric of reality. The moment when things break down, when things don't look quite right, and where there's suddenly a space in which you can intervene to make changes in the world. What we call reality always frays at the edges, and it's that fraying that is most interesting. It's, it gives you the chance to do things. Secondly, unlike traditional forms of, for example, Marxism or socialism, I view equality as a practice that we do here and now. That means you presuppose that the people you engage with are equal, and you ask what you have to do to ensure that that basic respect is enacted. That doesn't mean the world is equal. It's not. But if you don't operate that way, you end up, ironically, acting in a manner that destroys equality. A long history of the left has said the reverse. They've said, the world is not equal, therefore we cannot act equally. We can employ violence. We can employ tactics that actually destroy people. I think that's wrong. I think if you're committed to equality, you enact equality here and now. That doesn't mean we know what equality is. It changes in practice. We learn from each other about what equality is. Equality is about difference. It's not about equivalence. It's not about being the same. So for me, that's a second crucial thing that I study, those practices of emerging equality. Third, and this is crucial for me, and it's, it's nice to be able to quote Madonna <laughs> in a lecture about so-called philosophy and politics. Critical theory looks at nature, what we take to be natural, as something historical. 
Scientists have always known this. The natural world changes. It's not stuck. It's not just a mute object that doesn't, that, that doesn't respond to what you do. So it historicizes nature. But secondly, what that means is we are ourselves material creatures. We live in a material world, um, as Madonna pointed out. So I'm not sure she meant the same thing um, when, she, when she sang that. Fourthly, and this is really important, contingency. I said earlier on that basic respect for difference means that you might be wrong. That means that the settled views we have about what is natural, about what is right, are always open to contestation. And again, it's ironic. The sciences have known this for a long time. Look at philosophy of science. Scientists only ever get to a point where they say this is the best possible argument or the best possible drawing on all the evidence. This is the most we can say. But they're never, they're never absolute about it. It's ironic. In the humanities, we tend to be absolutists. Um, I, as a consequence, emphasize contingency, drawing on um, the sciences. And lastly, and this again draws on the work of Judith Butler, whom I'll talk about in a moment, a commitment to nonviolence, an aggressive commitment to nonviolence. That doesn't mean that there will not be instances in which violence takes place. But if it ever does, it has to be as, because you have no other possible way of acting. Violence is always wrong. And again, that goes against a long history of the left, which basically says some lives can be sacrificed in the interests of the greater struggle, the greater good, whatever. I, I think that that is wrong. So that, for me, that embodies the principles that underpin critical theory. On the one hand, almost a quasi-scientific study of how things work, of social and political processes. On the other hand, a commitment to how you do that research and how you engage with the people that you do research with. And inevitably, I'm, I will be going over time, but um, OK. Um, so critical theory is not traditional philosophy. Critical theory asks a different question to philosophers. Philosophers say, what is truth? What is it to be, what is rationality? What is ontology, being? They ask the is question. Critical theorists say, what are the consequences of accepting this idea of what it is to be human for the lived practices that engage people's lives? What does it do? If we say, for example, this is what rationality is, what does that mean for people who don't recognize that? What does that mean for people in mental institutions? What does our legal system do to people if you accept those categories? Let me give you a simple example, one that um, ha actually has a bearing on when I first started at the University of Brighton. In Gender Trouble, Judith Butler asks, what are the consequences of accepting the argument that there are only two sexes, male and female, that these binary opposites are the basis for reproduction and the basis for all life, with obvious gender identities, fixed roles in the order of social reproduction. It's a classic Marxist argument. How does this affect the lives of those who cannot, do not, will not conform to those practices? How did and how does the policing of sex and gender, not necessarily as much in Britain today, but certainly when I arrived in Britain in the 1990s, how does that cause harm to lives, to the way people live? And note what Butler is doing there. She's not asking, what is sex, what is gender? She's saying, what are the consequences if we accept these definitions? I'm not interested in answering the absolute questions. I'm more interested in what happens in practice to the way people live together. In a similar vein, we can ask, as do contemporary decolonial activists, what are the forms of power at work when supposedly neutral ideas like rationality, morality, knowledge are assumed as universal? What happens with those ideas in practice? Critical theory, you might say, takes philosophy down to size. Not all philosophers like this. As I've experienced uh, sometimes um, in manners that were not pleasant. At Brighton, 
This was a long time ago, and the colleagues involved are no longer here, which is why I feel uh, authorized to speak. At Brighton in 2003, I was told by a very senior colleague that Judith Butler had undermined the feminist struggle because I had introduced her work on a master's degree. I was told that I should teach a proper text in feminist politics that defended the politics of feminism in an appropriate manner. And of course, what Butler puts into question is what is deemed appropriate to sex and gender. Even though she at the same time, they are at the same time, are committed to feminist politics. Um, for some colleagues, though, that was too much because it was undermining. And these are colleagues on the left. It undermined their idea of what counted as the real struggle um, in politics. Okay, how is all of this relevant to democracy and climate change? So let me begin with the philosophers that I said I was going to be a little bit nasty to. Um, knowing that none of you can disagree. You may be disgusted and stand up and leave. I, I, that's your right, but you'll miss the glass of wine that is the temptation at the end of the lecture. <laughs> the key answer that many philosophers give to the question, what is it to be human, is really simple. Human beings are rational. Because they are rational, they are free. They can act. Human beings have language. Other creatures are not rational. They cannot communicate. Because we are rational, we supposedly have a free will. I've always asked what a free will is. The closest I've ever seen to free will is Free Willy, that great film about the whale that was, was stuck in captivity. Um, I don't know what a free will is. But anyway, because we act, we supposedly have free will. We don't simply behave. It is said other creatures simply behave. I've always been suspicious of this argument. It suffers the Baron Munchausen problem, um, the circularity of when you say what makes rationality justifiable, you can only ever go back to rationality. And when I see a circular argument, I begin to see possible violence at play. There is a point at which rationality comes to resemble unjustifiable force, when its truth has to be insisted upon, when you've cornered the opponent until they, all they can do is say, yes, okay. Um, that phrase, be rational, which I know many women in the room will have experienced in relationships, still resonates today with those longer histories of exclusion. Philosophers like to absolve rationality of this history, but in truth, we haven't escaped it. Instead, I study reason as a form of power. I ask, how has the deployment of reason, his, reason historically been used to deprive women, indigenous people, enslaved people, those deemed mentally ill, those who are deemed incapable of acting? How has it been deployed to exclude those people from personhood? They were said to be closer to nature. John Locke made these arguments. They were said to be incapable of acting rationally, of owning property. They were like animals. I'll come back to that deployment of the idea of the animal. But rationality does something else. It divides the world into two sets. And I, I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about this. There's something really odd. It's the founding gesture of philosophy. Philosophy says, on the one hand, there are human beings. They are rational. They're capable of being moral because they can decide what to do and what not to do. They can communicate. They use language. And on the other side, there are animals. Animals that may be meat, pets, be made extinct, property that are deemed irrational. Now, I want you just for a moment, and this is part of the work I'm doing at the moment, drawing on a French philosopher, Jacques Derrida, who died some years ago. What does this word animal actually mean? Because it's a category. It's not something that exists. There is no one thing that is an animal. There are instead an infinite variety of creatures that fit into this box, into this set. And all of them 
are given one common feature. They do not have rationality. And because they don't have rationality, in law, they are things. They cannot be deemed to have any rights. In European law, it is almost impossible to think of animals as persons. In Latin America, it's the reverse, actually. Increasingly, that is the case, to extend personhood. In the way it's been extended to corporations, personhood is now increasingly being extended to other creatures. So on the one hand, in, on this side, what this does is it reduces an infinite variety of species to something which is merely an object, whose purpose is solely to serve the kings of the world, human beings. But it also does something to human beings. Because instead of viewing ourselves, and if I, if I was skilled enough with doing things on PowerPoint, I'd have done this diagram, but unfortunately I'm not. I should by this day, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm supposed to be a professor. Um, the, the, um, the, what this diagram should have is a whole lot of circles in which there are a set of things we share with some animals, with different animals, and a set of things we don't. And then what we would see is a whole variety of differences in which animals, some things we call animals, share things with us, like the ability to make decisions, which some animals do, like potentially the ability to communicate, as contemporary scientists, some contemporary scientists argue. Um, blood, speed, I mean, there's a whole range of commonalities. But as soon as we begin to recognize that we're part, as Darwin noted, but unfortunately with this hierarchy, as soon as we recognize that we're part of a natural world, we begin to displace this reduced idea of what it is to be human, because the human is now multiplied around a whole set of new axes, the ones that I'm incapable of showing because of my inability to use PowerPoint. I think the category animal, which founds philosophy, is actually a violent category. I think it justifies all sorts of things. Moreover, and if you go back to what I said about the Enlightenment philosophers, most of those philosophers were racists. Hegel, Kant, Locke, Rousseau, the touchstones for our theories of democracy. Their attitudes to animals was fundamental to the racisms that underpinned their work because they used the category of the animal to describe those who were deemed to be excluded from participation in the demos. The figure of the animal plays another role then. It affects how we treat other human beings. It separates some humans, and that's why I've got this overlap here, because sometimes some humans end up in this box. But I also want to use that critically and suggest that the reverse should begin to happen. The idea of the animal is a mobile army of metaphors that we use over and over. Think of the Nazis. Vermin, lice, rats. Think of the way those words are deployed to describe certain human beings and, how, and the effect of that, because they are deemed to be animals without reason, incapable of doing certain things. The, think of what took place in Rwanda, where on the radio, the Rwandan, the Hutu radio station, called upon the people to go out and kill the cockroaches that were not human. So this notion of the animal, I think, has played a key role in some of the longer-term forms of oppression that structure the world that we now live with. For me, there is something truly bizarre about invoking reason to justify the mass killing of other species, the industrialized slaughter every day of hundreds of thousands of other creatures to indulge our eating habits. Every year, billions of animals killed. Yep. What, uh, John Kutsir, a writer whose work I, I really love, the novelist, um, makes a comparison between the Holocaust and what happens to animals every year. But he does so on purpose because it, it, it upsets people, the comparison, for good reason. But in upsetting people, it also forces them to pause and think, what is it we are doing that makes us who we are? Now, if I'm right, the idea of what counts, if we begin to change this, and I, I should have put something else up here. For, for critical theory, for politics, this was always the body politic. We were called political animals. 
So political falls on this side. And over here, everything is deprived from being political. But if you begin to pluralize this, if the diagram falls apart, if the differences and the similarities begin to look different, then the very idea of what it means to be a political animal has to shift as well. Now, I'm going to come back to that um, in a moment, but I want, in order to get there, to say something about democracy. And this goes back to work that I've done in, in the book that Stephen referred to. Um, I don't think that we live in democratic societies or democratic regimes. In fact, I think it's a mistake to ask if a social order is democratic. I think democracy is a practice that we do, a practice of equality. And often, the agents of democracy are not states. They are social movements. Think of climate activists forcing the question of climate onto the agenda in a way that many of our political leaders will never do. Or think of the Black Lives Matter movement that has compelled recognition of the much longer histories that made us who we are, made the university what it is. Now, I've, I, I've done, the, obviously, a, a number of other colleagues around the world have done this type of work, but I very briefly just want to indicate the problems with the idea that democracy is a closed regime. The first question that you ask about the demos is who is a member of the demos? And hopefully you can see where this is going. Because in classical Greek, the demos had no number. It always opened the question of how you restricted who was of the demos. Monarchy, aristocracy. Monos, the one, the king, the ruler. Aristocracy, aristos, the few were the rulers. But the demos doesn't refer to a number. So that type of regime asks the question, who belongs? In the same way we are asked that question when an immigrant comes to the border today. What rights should we extend? On what basis do we exclude? So, so to th this goes against a long-standing tradition of, demo of democratic thought, which views democracy as a regime, as something closed, fixed, with citizenship, etc. But secondly, the word kratos. Kratos in the Greek is the common ability of all to act. But what's really interesting is kratos doesn't say what the form of that action should be. Um, if I, and forgive me for being technical about this, but if you look at monarchia, archaea is the power of a regime. It's very clear in, in the ancient Greek. Archaea is about a regime. But kratos is about power that can be enacted anywhere. It's the capability of all to enact equality. So what, what might, going back to the ancient Greeks, and it's interesting, of course, that the word is not originally Greek. It's from Sanskrit, but that's another. So we need to decolonize the Greek view. Of the, sorry if there's any Greeks in the audience. I apologize. And if you're from Athens, I particularly apologize. Um, but, but what this means is if we think of it in those terms, we open up democracy outside of the bounds of a regime to begin to think of democracy, and these are words I used in my book, as the often inappropriate appropriation of democracy in unexpected practices of equality. Sometimes democracy surprises us, and it's very rarely states that enact democracy. States are always too late. They always catch up after the fact when struggles have already taken place, when people have made demands. So for me, democracy is a practice that presupposes we are equal, but it opens up the question of what that equality means um, in hopefully interesting ways um, in, in social life. This frees democracy from being caged. We live in nation states, so we can only think of democracy in the nation state. But think of the movements of the past two decades. They don't respect borders. Think of the climate movement. It would make no sense for climate activists to say, oh, we're just British, okay, and we're just going to have climate change in Britain and the bit of the sky above Britain. Um, it makes no sense. Think of Black, uh, Black Lives Matter that are invoking histories of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, that involved the whole world. 
So democracy breaks those borders. It upsets the borders within which we operate. And of course, states often catch up with this. They have to catch up with this. And you can probably see where, where this is going. Because then this then raises the question of where we draw the limits of the demos. I said earlier on that the demos is often viewed as human beings. We view humans as the basis of the demos. And then we have an argument about who counts, what's relevant, and political theory spends an awful lot of time trying to work out how people count, where they should count, um, how we recognize the rights of immigrants, etc. Um, I, I want to, with a number of other colleagues who are working in this direction, begin to rethink the idea of the demos as only limited to human beings. And I know that uh, this is the privilege of the narcissism of the professorial lecture, is I can speculate and suggest things that actually I think in practice are beginning to happen. I've only made two points really so far, besides the bit at the beginning where I went on about the past. The first is that using rationality as a category to distinguish humans from other creatures is deeply problematic, both in principle and in practice. The second is that democratic politics has transformed before our eyes, and it always will. We see this in two ways. One is in the changes we're familiar with, but the second is in the so-called morbid symptoms of this period. Right-wing populisms, what are they reacting to? To all of those social movements I spoke about before. They look like they're looking backwards. They're trying to hold on to a past that actually never existed. But that's partly their appeal. It's also my reason for optimism, because that past cannot survive. It's, it's dead. Um, the, the, in a sense, they are, they're playing with ghosts. Um, but the ghosts uh, will, I hope, come back to haunt them. So how does this bear on climate change, on the rights of animals? Surely democracy is a secondary issue. Surely climate change is a technical, a scientific concern. Climate change has compelled me, and I, I am beginning to finish. I have just a few pages left. Let me just check the time. I've got a few minutes, so you can indulge me for three or four more minutes. Climate change has compelled me to go beyond my own view of democracy. One held for many years that democracy only is about humanity. If there are no appropriate limits to the demos, then we have to think very carefully when we do place limits on the demos. Why should we exclude other creatures from recognition as equals? And at this point, the philosopher shouts in my ear, and I can feel the bug on top of my ear, because they're not rational. They have no language. They cannot laugh. If anyone has a dog, they know that's rubbish. They do not understand death. They cannot plan for the future. They can't take out insurance. They don't understand pain. All the things that one of my um, erstwhile colleagues used to say to me on a regular basis. But there are two problems with this view. The line that divides us from other creatures is not secure. There is an emerging science that indicates the extraordinary qualities of other creatures. Different, yes, not reducible to human consciousness or human ideas about reason. And I draw on that emerging science. Moreover, a number of political and critical theorists think the same. Will Kimlicker, met for a long time I thought he was conservative, Eva Meyer, Julia Donaldson, Siobhan O'Sullivan, among others, they all suggest that we need to begin to rethink democracy to extend rights and citizenship to other creatures. In some cases, to rivers, to forests, to mountains. For some, this even means recognizing that the earth is acting. So Bruno Latour, a French anthropologist, says, let's give up the idea that only humans act. The earth is acting. It's basically slapping us in the face and saying, you've screwed me around for too long. I've had enough. It's time for you to leave this planet. If you asked most animals, I suspect that would be their answer as well. Others have focused on the overlapping traits that we share with animals, pain, hunger, 
the need for space and food, the ability to make some decisions. And they develop a politics that they say should begin in empathy rather than rationality that is an attempt to exclude. In short, in the future, what is called zoopolis, as opposed to the polis, which is the traditional idea of politics, animals, though in some sense dependent, should be considered as capable of exercising agency. So my question tonight is whether or not democratic equality can apply to other creatures. If so, then we need to rethink democracy. We need to extend equality to other ways of being, but without applying the standards that we apply to human beings to those beings. Because if we apply the same standards of equality, we screw up. Think only of what disability activists have taught us. In order to give equal access, we have to provide differential means of entering a building. So why not the same for other creatures? Why not say of other creatures, yes, they're different, but they can experience pain, so we should prevent that pain. Why not begin to think of the ways in which that difference is the basis for the remaking of equality? Equality is not about treating everyone the same. As Brian Masumi has written, humans need to unlearn their supposed cognitive and moral superiority based on reason and language. We have to develop a new politics of mutual inclusion. But it's not just in theory that this argument is being made. In Canada, Colombia, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, India, legal, legal personhood has already been extended to rivers, to forests, to mountains, and to some animals. Such recognition draws on indigenous views of rivers, forests, and land as the parents of all beings, including human beings. For indigenous activists, the separation of a species called the human from other creatures was bound to end in disaster. Indigenous peoples knew a long time before Adorno that humans are themselves part of a broader ecology from which they cannot be severed. These legal changes have begun to do something that the Enlightenment claimed to escape. They reanimate the earth, attribu attributing to the earth powers and agency, and they ask us to rethink humanity, not as the gods of creation or destruction, but rather as actors that rely on a whole ecosystem in order to be able to act. As the scientists in the room will tell you, have a very close look at your face and you will be disgusted with the microbes that populate your body and make your very life possible. So we're talking, in the, in the words of a book that I read recently, about the microbial state, a state which begins to take account of the complexity of the lives we actually live. Jane Bennett, a colleague in, in the States, has proposed what she calls a distributed agency. That doesn't mean saying human beings are incapable of acting, but it recognizes different types of agency, different types of acting within a broader ecology of relations. But note one thing. This does not mean we can return to nature because there is no longer a simple nature that has not been transformed by human beings. We know that in the depths of the ocean you'll find microplastics. We know that most creatures will have in their bodies some or other form of pollution. The nature that we live with is, you might say, a second nature that we have to learn to come to terms with. Indigenous leader Ailton Krenak has made this point strongly. He writes, what is called humanity is a dominant minority that has become a destructive force. How can we call ourselves human, he says, when over 70% of the world are completely alienated from participation in even the minimal exercise of democratic life, are still called savages? This civilizing abstraction, he writes, denies the plurality of forms of life, existence, and habits. The question, in my view, that we must face is if existing political practices, existing institutions, can begin to incorporate non-human voices 
but also those voices without a voice. The river, the mountain, in a manner that recognizes what's necessary to their survival, but also changes, to go back to the circles I had earlier on, what it means to be human being. Krenak uses the word civilizing abstractions. I prefer to call them political fictions. I think that philosophy for a long time has worked with a set of fictions that we take to be true. Think only of one of them, the nation state. It's an imagined community. And the imagined community has very strong effects. But that imagined community is something which, if you look historically, has changed. So we come to accept things as if they are the case, but they're always in motion, always changing. And if we extend our horizons beyond the so-called West, we find these arguments for thousands of years in, so in, in Hindu and Buddhist traditions that view all living creatures as sacred. The way we live now does not work. Our children, if they're to live at all, have to learn to live differently, and that means that we have to live differently. I want to finish by returning to the humanities and the social sciences, the site for critical theory work, and the school which I love and which I hope we can build again. We, I think, have a responsibility to learn from the sciences, precisely because the distinction between nature, the object of the sciences, and humanity, what we study in the humanities and the social sciences, is gradually being undermined. Just ask geographers for whom the difference between human geography and physical ge geography is much harder to maintain because of the interaction between the two. But we also need to rethink what we mean by humanity. The Enlightenment ideal of the free subject has allowed us to destroy the planet. Human beings are embodied. We're related to, we're part of broader ecologies that make our lives possible. The humanities and social sciences have always celebrated the fact that they are the principled place of resistance. But too many of us are fighting battles that have nothing to do with the world we now live in. A world transformed by new forms of demo democracy, by the changing climate crisis that we're all having to confront, by AI, by a range of other challenges that is the future for what the humanities can do. And of course, we're challenged by a planet in revolt, shouting at us to wake up before it's too late. Thank you.